Jada, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you, Erin? I am good. I'm really excited to get into this topic. So first things first, kind of tell our viewers a little bit how you got into advocating for missing people. Of course. So um, I was actually a law student when this issue really started to come about for me. Um, it was back in 2019. I was a 3L at William & Mary Law School. Um, most lawyers probably have joined a law journal. And so when you join a law journal, you actually have to write a law review article. Um, my, I was actually on the Journal of Women in the Law at the time. Um, it's now called the Journal of Race, Gender, and Social Justice. Um, and so at the time, you had to write about a topic that related to women in the law. Um, I've always been very passionate about missing persons cases, especially um, as it pertains to Black women and girls. And so I chose to write my article about that. And, you know, when it comes to this topic, there's, I guess, a phrase, what is called missing white woman syndrome. Mm -hmm. What exactly is that? And how does that um, play into the disparity of resources when it comes to, you know, missing people of color? Yeah, um, it's a phenomenon that you probably notice. Like if you watch just any channel like Investigation Discovery, where all the crime shows air, you probably see that most of the cases, especially back then, really focus on white women, white girls, and a lot of times white men too. Um, a lot of the times cases of POC, people of color, black and brown people, and even marginalized groups like LGBTQIA are often ignored. And so this um, term, missing white woman syndrome, just refers to the phenomenon of basically um, the media's tunnel-like vision um, and focus on young, white, and attractive and rich uh, women and oftentimes girls. Um, it really refers to the disparity that you see when it comes to media's coverage of those cases. So I guess the main question is, why are, you know, black and brown children, you know, black and brown women, why are they so disproportionately um, not classified as a runaway if something happened or, in, you know, in the initial investigation? What is it? Why, why not, you know label this group when as soon as this other group goes missing, it's just chaos. Yeah, um, I think um, statistics really give us a lot of the answers. So if you look at statistics, they really show that the stories of missing white women and children are probably considered more newsworthy. What newsworthy means is that they're actually more more deemed uh, newsworthy and coverable by uh, major news out outlets. Um, and so you see that those cases get a lot more attention. I think a lot of it um, is actually because of the lack of be, people being able to see black and brown people and marginalized groups as basically worthy of the attention, worthy of being found um, and discovered when they do go missing or when there is violence committed against them. And you know, you're like you mentioned, you're also an attorney. So when we look at things on the more legislative side and when it comes to laws, what steps do you think need to be put in place or laws that need to be put in place to help close those gaps and disparities? Yeah, I think especially when I wrote my article, um, which was a few years ago at the time, uh, at, at this point now, um, there was a lack of legislation and regulatory remedies that kind of helped and focused on those cases. Um, as of recent, we've actually had a lot of development in that area. And so what I really think needs to happen or needed to happen at that time was advocacy um, in the form of, um, you know, advocating in front of Congress, right into your local um, congressperson or representative to make sure that they are aware that this issue exists. Um, but since then, we've actually had a few bills pop up and a few programs pop up, um, one of which is in Minnesota. They actually um, formed a task force that focused specifically on Black women and girls. Um, and from that task force actually came an office that is focusing on those cases. And so advocacy like that really, really helps. Um, and I cannot trust, stress that enough. And, you know, even throughout your research and your advocacy work, you know, you mentioned in, in um, you know, papers that you've written, were there any... Throughout your research, were there any surprising things that you found that you were like, oh, I did not know that? Or were there any things that you were like, you know what, I figured? Yeah, um, I think what really sticks out to me, even to this day, as it becomes more known and popular, is the fact that in the cases of Black and Brown people and marginalized groups, a lot of times the reason why um, there isn't a focus on search and recovery of those people who go missing is because they're deemed runaways. Um, what that means is that, so if, in particular, I think everybody knows what an Amber Alert is. Um, that system actually relies on a criteria of five different um, criteria, which law enforcement uses to determine whether or not um, those cases are going to be uh, basically given resources and attention and whether or not that alert is going to be issued. Um, at least two of those criteria actually focus on the law enforcement's belief of whether or not that person um, is actually endangered and missing. 
Um, and so oftentimes law enforcement departments um, kind of, you know, they basically decide, hey, this person either ran away or does not want to be, be found, even if they're a child. Um, and oftentimes that's not true. And so when I was actually doing research for um, my analysis and my legal note, what I found is that in a lot of those cases for Black girls, that happened. Um, one of which was Jolie Musa, who went missing um, in the early 2010s, um, or sorry, um, late 2010s. And uh, she was deemed a runaway and she was actually found murdered. And so they actually eventually um, found and charged the person um, who actually committed the violence against her. But had it been found out earlier that she actually was endangered, uh, something probably would have changed in that situation. You know, and I can even attest to that, you know, when you when you were talking about how law enforcement makes that decision on if they're yeah. runaway and all that other stuff, you know, being a former local news reporter and anchor, I can I can't tell you how many times we have, you know, started off a story and then it just kind of just falls flat when it comes to, you know, black black and brown children, even specific, like you said, yeah. specifically black and brown women. It's just kind of like, okay, so where do what happened to this? And we get nothing. But on the other hand, then you get the stories about the missing white children and women and stuff. And we see the story from beginning to the end. And it, right. it's, it's, just, it's sad. So, you know, you mentioned Amber Alerts. So let's talk about California. Now, how does California's Amber Alert law currently res um, restrict the activation of the Amber Alert system? And what impact does this have on missing children cases in general? Right. Um, well, I can't say I haven't studied California's um, law as it pertains to Amber Alerts very closely. Um, I think I would say I specialize mostly in the DMV area, primarily Virginia, because that's where I'm from. Um, but even in those alert systems, so a lot of state laws actually adopt from the federal law. Um, and Amber Alert is codified in the federal system. And so you'll see that it kind of mirrors. So a lot of the criteria may, may be written differently. So the word or language might be a little bit different, but basically the criteria is the same usually across the board. Um, and so that's usually how that goes. So, you know, as we have conversations like this, as we learn more about these cases, what should we be doing? If we hear about missing, you know, um, people, what should we do first as, as citizens? Um, I think as citizens and as general lay people, we just need to pay attention. And I think since I actually conducted my analysis and research, that actually has, you know, it's come up a bit, which has been really great to see. Um, a lot of people are advocating on social media. Um, we use Twitter a lot. I think a lot of us use Twitter, and that's actually how we get our news first a lot of times these days. And I cannot tell you the amount of missing persons that I see come across my timelines, both Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, what have you, um, where people are actually reposting it, reposting it. So say, for instance, you see it come across your timeline, make sure you retweet it, give it a like, um, give it a comment, and make sure you share it with your family and friends who might be in that area where the missing person is. And even so, you know, too, are there ways or suggestions that you have for us to even make sure that those posts are credible, too? You know, make sure that we are that we are retweeting that, you know, appropriate and correct information. Yeah, that's a good question. And that's a tough one, especially as you see a lot of um, news that necessarily not is not necessarily true, or might be outdated come across your timelines. Um, what I would say and what I do is generally I just research I click through I look at the links I look at the profile of the person who's posted it and just make sure that I'm following up and doing my due diligence to ensure that it's credible. And when it comes to missing people, what is the main takeaway that you want our viewers to leave with today? Um, I want everyone to know that no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter what marginalized group or, you know, non-marginalized group you identify with, everyone is worthy and every life is worthy of being found and researched for, um, searched and recovered for, I'm sorry. Um, and so I want to make sure that the message is out that no matter what group you, do, you, you identify with and belong to, that you, you deserve to be found too. All right, Jada, thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk to us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. The Advocate Channel, Equal Pride, and Out Magazine are joining with iHeartMedia and Procter & Gamble for one of the biggest Pride celebrations online. The Advocate Channel is the official streaming partner for Can't Cancel Pride, and it's going into its fourth year. This year's host is Jojo Siwa, and you can watch Can't Cancel Pride right here on the Advocate Channel at advocatechannel.com and stream it live on the app. Can't Cancel Pride begins streaming June 15th at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. 
And thanks for watching Advocate today. Download the app in the Apple or Google Play Store to stream us live, and you can even subscribe on our YouTube channel. Make sure you do it. For the Advocate channel, I'm Aaron Dean.